So now you have small fry in your tank. What do you do next to feed them? Well, feeding these fry a small live food called paramecium is a great choice and easy to culture too. Enjoy this episode to learn exactly how and how easy it is. Okay, now we're going to try to prepare a culture of paramecium. What we need to do is, first of all, take a, a container. This particular container is a 1.75 liter. Uh, you could probably use a two liter. Uh, I use this one because the plastic is exceptionally thick. It means that it cleans well, holds up well. Also, uh, I use this one because the mouth is open and you can put either a baster in it or in fact I can put my bottle brush in it to clean out after I've used the uh, solution. So here I have a bottle that's uh, 1.75 liters. It um, has a lid that I put holes in just for oxygen and I usually um, use a piece of paper towel in between just to keep any uh, small insects out. So here's the water. I use dechlorinated water and I put it into my container to the maximum, almost the maximum part, part where this would be maximum surface area of the water. Any higher the surface area of the water would be less. So I have the water, I have the maximum surface area, and I'm going to put this aside. Now we need some medium besides water and what I use is organic uh, wheat berries it doesn't take much of them I get this from Amazon but it probably can be found apparently it can be found in most health food stores so there's nothing special about it other than it's uh, organic uh, hard wheat berries and it looks just like kernels of wheat and that's about it so we're going to process that so what we need is a saucepan. What we're going to do is uh, put that on there for uh, one cup of water. So I've measured out a cup of water and I just throw a cup of water on my saucepan. Then uh, I've taken the wheat berries out of, a, out of the uh, bag and I have a su uh, supply of them right next to my kitchen. And I take a half teaspoon which counts out to be, you know, something like that. It's it's not utterly important to make it an exact count. But here, here we just throw in some berries. And I'm going to now um, boil them for about 10 minutes. So I'm going to just put the oven on and set the timer for 10 minutes or so. Uh, maybe an extra minute because it's cold water. It'll take a minute to go up. So I'll start the timer and now I know and won't forget about what's on the stove. You don't want to boil just the one cup down to where it boils dry and then the berries are burned. That would be a disaster. So that's why I always set a timer to remind me. So the last thing that is also needed is uh, I use a little bit of um, yeast, bread yeast. I keep this in the refrigerator. We're only gonna need a tiny, tiny bit. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just show you how much I put in there. And you know, it's just, it's just a bit. Now I'm gonna put that initially in the solution. Putting it in now is fine. I can just put it in here. And uh, when I do that, the water, which was clear before now, takes on a slightly, uh, it looks a little milky when it settles. It kind of gives it a milky look and that uh, whitish substance and all is actually part of the um, yeast that's in the water. So we'll now boil the berries and see how it turns out. I'll pick it up. Let's um, go ahead and, and just pause for saving time and then we'll pick it up after uh, 10 minutes is done as you can see one minute has gone by the timers dropped down so we'll 
We'll start it up again when the uh, boiling is finished. Okay. We're back. Hope you didn't wait too long. Here, um, we're down to the last minute. And uh, the water's boiling away. But basically, for about 10 minutes, we've heated up these berries. We're softening them up. We're bringing out some of the glucose. Um, maybe some of the gluten or whatever or sugars that are in the berries and now we're going to use this water and the berries in our solution but actually um, right now I don't want to pour it boiling in there so I'm gonna let it cool down first so I'm going to uh, stop the timer and well it's still going I'm gonna turn off the uh, stove and let it cool down. There we go. And let's take it off the. Let it cool down completely, and we'll use that in our solution. So what I'm going to do is, uh, when it cools down, I'm going to take this. I make it easy for myself, and I just use a funnel. And then I'm going to pour everything, everything in there. So but um, I'm gonna wait for it to cool down. Now, we'll take a look, I think would be best at the actual cultures I have already in place and give you a little routine scenario whereby you might come up with uh, your own scenario based on how much of the paramecium you need and the like. So let's take a look at some of them. Here are various specimens I've been doing, uh, actual cultures. Here's the last one I did uh, just a number of days ago. This will give you an idea of how quickly the paramecium actually count. So this is important to know the last one. Let's see if I don't know how if it can be seen, but let's just take a look. There we go. As you can see, this is only from a few days ago. So they've multiplied to the point where I could actually, if I needed to, I could actually harvest from this one. And this is only a four day old. So what I'm doing is I'm gonna open this one up and I'm going to actually um, put a small amount into my new culture. This is the one we just prepared. And uh, I'm just gonna put some in. It's not important exactly, maybe quarter of a baster full. Maybe that's all I need. So this will be prepared or ready for the future. This one though, since I just did this one a couple of days ago, actually um, I did this two days ago. That's how many uh, paramecium on there. This is the ninth and that was done the seventh. I mark it here on the paper towel. So I'm going to just Add a little bit of pinch. I'm just going to take a little bit of yeast. It's sort of like acts as a food. And I'm going to give them one more little shot of yeast. Uh, my spoon was wet when I did that, so and that's why it's got some yeast on the spoon. It won't come off, but uh, not important. Just a little bit is fine to pinch if you want to pinch in there is all and I'm going to put this back and uh, I won't add any more yeast after, uh, I'll just uh, keep it as is now and wait till when I'm ready to harvest on the other hand the ones you see here in the box are the ones prior to that so this one will get moved to the back the one in the front will be the oldest now let's take a look at that one this is the one ready for harvesting and there is still thousands millions billions of these little sometimes you'll see some um, film at the top whenever I see some film at the top I usually kind of shake it up uh, the surface area so that the surface area can be broken up because they have to have the oxygen but as you can see the berries have just about um, um, fermented in a way and uh, all these are ready to go so what I'm going to do is show you how I harvest and uh, that gets moved out ready for harvesting. 
So this one will be the one next one to be used up. Then I just merely take my uh, previous ones and I move them up, getting them ready for the future. Just kind of cycle them up. And then the latest one that's now got a second dose of, of yeast goes to the back. And I can just keep on work depending on how much I need. So this is what I use uh, for feeding. It's very simple. It's uh, one of these common objects we find all the time. This one happens to be glass. I don't know that it matters, but I do know with the glass it's easier to clean. And um, I've taken out the straw. I don't want the straw because I'm going to pour off the top. So what I found is that the paramecium tend to congregate at the top of the, of the, of the culture. So at the top of this culture is the maximum amount and a lot of them. So I'm going to now uh, take this one from a month ago and I'm going to actually filter it because I don't want seeds, I don't want that muck to be in there. So I'm just going to take uh, a very fine, a very fine net and this net will be good enough to catch anything that's uh, can't, so small that it, the paramecium will go right through the net, that's for sure. We'll take a look at that in a second. So I'm going to go ahead and just pour right off the top. Get my uh, feeder ready for, and then this one is almost half, and I'll use this again when this feeder is gone, and I'll use it again the second time, and then I'll discard it. I don't need to strain it till the last drop. Paramecium, I'm mostly at the top, so I got quite a few, so I'm gonna take this and get rid of that. And now I have a bottle that looks good, ready to just pour into the tank. This is what I pour into the fry tanks whenever I'm feeding a fry, so I'm gonna screw that on. What's interesting is that uh, I don't need any medium, I don't need any berries, and even this, they will last a uh, couple of weeks in this container. And uh, this container will, will have um, all the paramecium. Let's take a look at it. As you can see here, it has all the little paramecium that I could use. The nice thing about these paramecium is that I put them in the tank with the fry and they don't just die, they actually live in, in the tank until the fry eat them. And uh, it's just because it's fresh water. Now it does smell bad, it doesn't smell great. People have used different culture mediums like I've tried the husks of corn, corn on the cob, and corn, the husks part, the leaves, and that works too, but it does make a stronger odor. I have noticed that using the wheat berries is the minimum amount of odor. It doesn't smell too bad, and especially, I just leave this open. This has got a little hole, tiny hole for, as you can see there, there's a little tiny hole, and this is open too. So these are two little holes that actually allow me to just pour out into the tanks. I go from tank to tank to tank, but the holes are big enough for an amount of oxygen. There's no problem with that. And now I'm ready to, this will last me as long as it lasts me and I'll just replace it with uh, filtered culture water as time goes on. So that's um, how basically I keep the cultures going in a very simple way. And I also keep the box maintained at a higher location in my fish room, up near the ceiling, not near the floor because it's kind of warmer there and it seems like they just thrive uh, there. So let's take a look at actually how easy it is to now feed the uh, tanks using this feeder. The thread fins are the smallest and they really need to have small foods when they're first hatched. So I'm just going to demonstrate. I have my food uh, hanging right here conveniently. I grab it and it has a nice hook so I just uh, can take it and uh, pour it into the tank like so and uh, boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. and as uh, I pour it in the 
whenever I get a dose, I do this several times a day. And by doing this, the solution of Dermesium, as you can see here, is uh, perfect in size for these guys. Now, in so doing, I've I just hang it here and leave it here for the uh, the next feeding. It's kind of hard to see with this camera, but on the naked eye, you should be able to see a white film, sort of a cloudiness to the water. Those that's not really a bacteria bloom. It's actually all the little microorganisms that you want for the fry to feast on. And I can put them in there like that, feed them several times a day, and I'm always happy that they have plenty to eat because they're just gorging on those little things that they find. And I, um, after the first two weeks, three weeks, uh, I introduce uh, bigger foods.